It gained national attention as the party drug that killed actor Matthew Perry, but it's legal in several states and being used to treat a variety of medical and mental conditions. But what exactly is ketamine and is it safe? All this and more up next on Prescription for Life. Hello and welcome to Prescription for Life. I'm Monica Robbins. Ketamine has been around for decades now. It's commonly used as an anesthetic in surgery, but it's also found its way into certain circles as a party drug. However, in recent years, ketamine has been used to treat mental health issues, including depression. The ketamine derivative, S-ketamine, also known as Spravato, is the only form of the drug that is FDA approved in order to help tackle treatment-resistant depression. An expert on the anesthetic joins us in a bit to talk about the drug, its benefits, and its dangers. But first, for one young Minnesota teen, the nasal spray Spravato was the only thing that actually helped, allowing him to finally get some comfort. At age 14, Kyle Eason's severe depression kept him out of school for nearly a year. It was scary. Very scary. I can't tell you how many emergency room visits we've had in the middle of the night. He tried every standard treatment available, but now, five years later, he's trying something new. That one milligram per kilogram of ketamine, which is 110 milligrams. Ketamine is an anesthetic, but its psychoactive effects made it a popular party drug. Now those same effects in controlled doses are helping depression patients like Kyle. So, well, I can actually like get to sleep now and not stay up for my, like, bad thought. Dr. Donald Malone is chair of psychiatry and psychology at Cleveland Clinic and president of Lutheran Hospital. For the last five years, the clinic's been conducting ketamine trials with patients suffering from depression. These are folks that do not respond to the typical antidepressants, the typical forms of psychotherapy, combinations thereof. And the effects are game-changing for some. That ketamine has what we call acute antidepressant effects. In other words, it works very quickly. Earlier this month, the FDA approved the first ketamine-derived nasal spray to treat depression, but there's still a lot of unanswered questions. Uh, the big question uh, that we don't know the answer to is how long does it keep working? Nor do they know the long-term effects on the brain, and it's potentially addictive. The abuse potential is, is there, and that's why the FDA is requiring certain monitoring uh, and certain guidelines you have to follow in order to give it. So like you just heard, ketamine can be addictive when misused. According to the DEA, ketamine can cause a series of unwanted side effects, including nausea, hallucinations, agitation, depression, and cognitive difficulties. While an overdose can cause unconsciousness and dangerously slow breathing. A year ago, after actor Matthew Perry was found unresponsive and floating face down in his jacuzzi, his cause of death listed as the acute effects of ketamine, along with several other contributing factors. In the weeks leading up to his death, Perry used large amounts of ketamine from multiple different sources. Just like other drugs, off-label use of ketamine can be harmful, but when used properly and for the right reasons, the drug can be beneficial. We now turn to our expert to shed some light on what this drug is and how it can help patients. Joining me now is Dr. Pavan Tanka, who is the Medical Director of Comprehensive Pain Recovery in Cleveland Clinic's Neurological Institute. Thank you so much for being here. My pleasure, thank you for the invite. Okay, so a lot of people, when they hear about ketamine, they probably think that it is an illegal street drug, and we just learned that it was the substance found in Matthew Perry. Uh, it was the primary cause of death when he died. So what is ketamine? Great, great question. So ketamine is an anesthetic. It was approved by the FDA in 1970 to put people to sleep for surgery. It also has an FDA approval for procedural sedation. So um, procedural sedation may be colonoscopy or other minor um, forms of um, sedation. What's interesting though is when people hear ketamine nowadays, 99% uh, of the use is uh, not FDA approved. It's what we refer to as off-label uses. Uh, and that's where we can get into some tricky situations if the medication is not monitored correctly. But it is legal in Ohio 
for being used to treat mental health disorders. Correct. So um, the medication has been around again, as I mentioned, since 1970. Um, we started using it for chronic pain in the 80s. Um, around the 90s, early 2000s, we saw it had a, a, an effect for depression. Uh, Off-label use have sort of spread from there, but again, it is a legal medication. Um, and when properly monitored by a health professional, it can be safe and effective, but it is not without risks. So talk to me about how, do, how does one find out if this is a treatment that they should even talk to their doctor about? Absolutely. Um, so for the off-label uses, uh, more often than not, a patient would be speaking with either their mental health provider, psychiatrist, or uh, an anesthesiologist or other pain management specialist. Those are the two major uses for its off-label use. Uh, and it's not so much to see if a patient is a good candidate for the ketamine, it's to see if they're not a candidate, because again, it can have a number of different side effects and we want to make sure safety comes first before administering it for someone for either mental health or for pain reasons. So who's not a candidate? There, there can be a number of different uh, things we look at. So uh, with a history of psychosis or schizophrenia, there may be a uh, slight increased risk. Um, uh, individuals with cardiac uh, issues, so um, different murmurs, atrial fibrillation. Uh, if you are potentially could be pregnant, also something we want to take into account. Um, but ultimately, we do it on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, looking at the advantages and benefits versus the risk. Is it being used now more for mental health or more for pain? I would say uh, for mental health more recently. So again, as I mentioned, it's been used off and on for pain since the, uh, the mid 80s. Um, but since the early 2000s, when studies started showing it had a dramatic effect on depression, it's been used more and more. Um, now, again, if you were to do a, a quick internet search, uh, it's touting use for um, anxiety, post-traumatic stress, OCD. But again, as I mentioned before, none of these have been officially studied uh, by the FDA. So these are what we refer to, again, as off-label uses. So what are the risks? that, you know, if you're going to use it for off-label, what are some of the risks that people m may face and, you know, that think people aren't really thinking about? Absolutely. So with uh, any medication, the risks increase as the dose increases. Um, but some of the common side effects of the medication include um, sort of a, a psychedelic experience, an out-of-body experience. Uh, there is a risk. Uh, unfortunately, there is always a risk for uh, addiction or dependence with this medication. So that's another reason uh, a very thorough evaluation should be done before it's started. Um, other patients can get some uh, short-term side effects during the medication use, nausea, vomiting, dizziness. Uh, and rarely there can be some bladder issues such as um, cystitis that occurs. So how is this administered? It can be administered in a number of different ways, and here's where it gets a little tricky. Um, so historically, it's been administered through an IV. So you come in, we start an IV, and we run a certain dose over a certain amount of time over either one day or multiple days. Um, however, more recently, uh, it can be found as an intranasal spray, a tablet, a lozenge, uh, and that's where it gets a little trickier in terms of what dose are you getting, who's watching you after you get it. So is that, is it typical, you know, for more of a mental health dosage, you're getting it through the IV and more for the pain management, you're using the, the nasal spray or the oral medication? Excellent question. So the FDA has actually approved intranasal ketamine, also known as Pravada, um, for treatment-resistant depression. Uh, that is one of the few FDA approvals for um, ketamine. Uh, outside of that, uh, it varies. So for pain management, um, we oftentimes use an IV infusion. Uh, also, if uh, not covered by insurance, uh, IV ketamine can also be rapidly helpful for uh, severe treatment-resistant depression as well. But it depends on on the comfort level of the provider uh, and the facility that you're getting it at. I'm glad you brought up insurance. Is all of ketamine treatment covered by insurance? It is not. It is not. So more often than not, insurance wants uh, FDA approval, a significant studies backing its utility. Uh, and so more often than not, this is not covered by insurance. Uh, and there's an out-of-pocket expense that can vary based on location uh, and how many times you're getting the infusion. Is this often a, a treatment of last resort for most people? Yes, correct. Um, by no means is ketamine a first-line treatment. 
um, for, uh, again, treatment-resistant depression. Patients have often tried a number of different medications, both beforehand, a number of different treatments and therapies. Uh, same thing with chronic pain. Um, patients have usually exhausted a number of conventional treatments, and then the conversation may uh, turn to ketamine as another option. So Really, what's the success rate for ketamine? Yeah, so it's um, unusually successful for the appropriate patient. So for the patient who's exhausted all other conventional therapy and has not benefited from it, um, ketamine both for depression and pain can help um, uh, up to 30% of patients in addition to any other baseline medications they may be on. Um, so it's, it's really quite, quite effective when you think we've ran out of everything else now we have another option that can be quite effective. Does it interfere with other medications or do you have to stop other medications? Uh, usually not. Ketamine is very safe. There, there is an antibiotic um, that we sometimes uh, take into account. Uh, there's also grapefruit juice that can change its metabolism a little bit. Um, but more often than not, as I tell patients, um, very safe, doesn't interact with other medications. We don't need to take anything into account. How do you stop people who are taking the oral medications and the and the nasal medications from becoming addicted? Correct. So addiction uh, and substance use disorder has a couple different components. There's a genetic component, there's a social component, there's also access to the medication. So one of the easiest ways is to not have access to the ketamine. Um, unfortunately, again, if uh, people do develop substance use disorder through the ketamine, uh, we need intensive treatment um, for them. Uh, but ultimately, education and letting patients know this is not an, uh, uh, an inert, if you will, substance. This has the risk for abuse uh, and addiction. Throwing that out there um, right off the bat may be helpful. There are a number of, I mentioned Ohio, it's legal. It's, it's legal for this kind of treatment in a number of states. There are also a number of centers popping up everywhere where people can go to get this kind of treatment. But how do you know these centers are all legitimate and these centers actually know what they're doing? Absolutely, and this is where it comes down to, uh, comes back to use uh, the patient doing some homework, uh, and if not sure, getting a second opinion. Uh, oftentimes, some of my patients aren't able to come back to see me, um, but they'll reach out to a clinic and say, hey doc, here's the information, or here's someone you can speak with, uh, and I will uh, speak with them as well. But some basic guidelines you wanna look into is to see if they are uh, certified, or they know how to administer ketamine. If the center has all the emergency equipment you would need for, um, an adverse event via ketamine. How many infusions or how many treatments do they do? Uh, and sort of look for outcomes as well. So doing your homework ahead of time, asking to see the protocol. What what do they do in at the event of an emergency? Um, how many emergencies have they had? So doing some background work ahead of time may save you a lot of uh, hassle uh, down the road. Is there an age limit for this? Can it be used on children? It can, it can. Um, some initial studies suggested it may interfere with some uh, brain development. Um, however, this comes back down to the risks and benefit. If you have someone with very significant treatment resistant depression uh, and uh, there's nothing else that helped, Maybe we say, okay, maybe there may be an issue with development down the road, but let's stabilize the patient now. Same thing with chronic pain. If the pain has completely debilitated someone, let's take the risk and see if we can help them. You know, you can get this off the internet. Yes. Uh, so the FDA actually put out a statement last year um, stating very clearly that these um, various formulations are not approved by them. Again, the Food and Drug Administration, essentially they're looking for two things. They're looking to see if a medication works, but more importantly, I would argue, to make sure it's safe. And basically what they're saying is, hey, we don't know if these other uh, formulations work and we don't know if they're safe. Uh, and so th there can be a risk when you order something online. Uh, I tell patients oftentimes when they come in for infusions, the infusions are safe, but just in case, we're going to monitor you. We'll be looking at your heart rate, your blood pressure, how you're breathing. Uh, and interestingly enough, there has not been a day that has gone by where someone doesn't have uh, an adverse event to the, the ketamine. Their blood pressure goes a little higher. Uh, their heart rate goes a little higher. We're monitoring them to make sure they're safe, but if this was happening at their home and something were to happen, that, that's where we get worried. And again, the FDA appropriately put out that statement last year saying, hey, be really, really careful. They didn't go as far as to say, don't do this, but they did say be very, very careful because we don't know what the risks are. Your final advice to people who are even considering using ketamine? Speak with your healthcare provider. 
go over the risks, the benefits, but always do your homework. Always do your homework. There, there is significant risk with this if you don't do your proper homework ahead of time. Doctor, thank you for your insight. My pleasure, thank you. Like our experts said, do your homework before you start taking a drug such as ketamine. That is essential. And when we come back, we'll hear from one Ohio woman who learned the hard way that ketamine was not for her. When it comes to using ketamine and esketamine, certain individuals with specific health issues do have an increased risk for harmful side effects, which is something one patient who is diagnosed with bipolar disorder is all too familiar with. Chris Wade battled mental health disorders most of her adult life. I was diagnosed with bipolar um, seven years ago. Over the years, she suffered multiple misdiagnoses and massive medication errors. Still, her depression remained treatment resistant. She tried transcranial magnetic stimulation, or TMS, to stimulate her nerve cells to improve the depression systems to no avail. Then the facility mentioned Spravato, a nasal spray FDA approved in 2019 for treatment resistant depression. The drug is esketamine, made from ketamine, an anesthetic long used to treat depression. But esketamine is a more potent version. I wanted to try it because people with mental illness are desperate. And if no medication is working, it's kind of like a last resort. Insurances don't cover and it's very expensive. I did research on it, but I guess not enough because of the horrific experience that I endured. Ketamine and esketamine are legal treatments in Ohio, but both can induce profound psychedelic experiences and hallucinations. Spravato is only available through a restricted program called Risk Evaluation and Mitigation Strategy Program, or REMS. It has boxed warnings relating to side effects, including suicidal thoughts. Currently, it is not approved for bipolar patients. Chris never should have received it. Bipolar disorder, uh, which can sometimes uh, cause mania or, or psychosis, uh, there's a danger there that psychedelics um, can uh, exacerbate psychosis uh, or, or bring about mania or psychosis in those people. When Chris received her fourth treatment, a higher dose, she had a horrific experience. I had suicidal thoughts and within like five minutes, I was thinking I was gonna have a heart attack. My heart rate went up to like 160. Blood pressure was 160 over 110. I couldn't move, I totally was like frozen. I felt like I was in a cement box. I couldn't speak, I couldn't hear, um, I was hallucinating. A healthcare professional checked on her, but Chris couldn't communicate anything was wrong. But when you remove components of that protocol and you, for example, just give someone a dose of ketamine alone in a room, I think it'll be very unlikely that they would experience a therapeutic benefit uh, or a lasting therapeutic benefit, um, and it actually increases the potential for harm. Chris doesn't want anyone else to have this experience. She's kept records, reported her experience to Spravato's manufacturer and insurance company, as well as others. Experts say it's important not to try these treatments on your own. Stick with one health care provider who knows your medical history and can guide you through new options now available. At the time, Chris did not have a psychiatrist treating her. When you are talking about newer treatments that are expanding pretty rapidly, um, the, you might see some of these variations in how people follow guidelines. It is tricky to kind of navigate that for an individual. So when you're trying something new, it's not terrible to ask multiple people about what their opinions are. That'll do it for this week's edition of Prescription for Life. Thank you so much for watching. We'll be back next week with another dose. Until then, I'm Monica Robbins wishing you and yours good health.